Is it really worth twice the price of a good Seat Leon Cooper? Hello guys and welcome back to the Volks Wizard channel. Now some of you may know I have just sold my Seat Leon Cooper 280 to make way for this Mark 7 Golf GTI Club Sport S. But before it goes, I thought I'd make a video comparing the two cars because in the past I'd called the Seat Leon Cooper 280 with the Sub 8 pack, the Thinking Man's Golf GTI Club Sport S. And I just wanted to make sure that I am doing the right thing. These two cars have got more in common than you might think. They've both set Nürburgring Nordschleife front wheel drive lap records. They both made it to the Evo Car of the Year shortlist and they were both, as they are spec today, in the low 30,000 price range. But only the Golf was made in limited numbers and only the Golf is today deemed worthy of being in a collection. So it's a much more special car, but it doesn't necessarily make it a better hot hatch. Is it really worth twice the price of a good Seat Leon Cupra 280? Well, it's not too late for me to change mine, so let's find out now. Before we do that though, I'd like to say a big thanks to everybody who has subscribed to the channel. Thank you very much. Every subscription means a lot to a small channel like this one, but if you haven't subscribed yet and you like this kind of content, then please please do so on a lot of devices there should be an icon on the bottom right of the screen or there's a link in the description of the video below or just hunt out that famous red button and click that okay let's start off then by having a look around the outside of the set leon cooper 280 now in the intro i mentioned the sub 8 pack it's worth talking about this a bit more because it was an option pack that brought a normal 280 spec closer to the one that set the Nürburgring front wheel drive lap record back in 2015, which was just under eight minutes, hence sub eight. There wasn't an awful lot to it, to be perfectly honest. I wouldn't go as far as calling it as a, a performance pack because there was no extra performance. However, the front brakes were upgraded from 340s, which were marginal on track, to 370 mil Brembos. There were also some styling tweaks as well. Most distinctively, you could order an orange styling pack, which put the grille and the mirrors and the Cupra badging on the back and the wheels in orange. If you were less extrovert or not having a midlife crisis, you could go for black for a more discreet look, but it's worth seeking out these cars if you're looking for a Cupra 280 because I think the package just makes them that little bit more special and closer to being a rival of the Club Sport S. Even though this car's got the orange, it isn't a sub eight, it's normal Cupra 280 with upgraded brakes and therefore it's dynamically as good as identical. It was originally owned by Seat UK. Don't know what it was doing. Maybe they painted the bits to make it look like a Sub8, um, but it's a really, really nice spec. And in this white three-door manual configuration, it's got sort of a motorsporty look to it that I think is a pretty good rival for the Club Sport S. It's also got, a, sort of, I think, a Maxton front splitter, which isn't standard. We've got lots of honeycomb here, the grill, the main gaping air intake, and these outer grills, which are mainly sort of open, so they're all pretty functional. We've got a gloss black, black section here. It would tempt you to take the number plate off because without it, it looks really, really good. And we've got these five nostrils here that are very similar to those ones that Audi are sort of sticking on their cars now that are tribute to the Audi Sport Quattro. We've got LED headlights, which um, were, I think it was the first production car to get them as standard. We've got front and rear parking sensors. Down the side though, it's sort of a lot less distinctive. We haven't got any mouldings, we haven't got any badging. On this non sub model, we don't have a sill cover. The sub models get a sill cover. I don't think it makes it faster around the Nürburgring, but it does look really, really good. And this car needs it because we've got slightly wider wheels that stick out a bit more. And with that splitter, it just kind of loses the effect when you see how sort of skinny the side of the car is. The wheels, which were 30 slash three style, a BBS style, a standard on the Sub 8, they're prone to cracking, unfortunately. And this car is now on Racing Line's R360 wheel, so half an inch wider. Though all Cupra's have got this little bit of plastic there that widens the arch so the tire stays within the body line that's on the front and the back. As this isn't a Sub 8, it didn't have the Brembo's, but instead we've got Racing Line Stage 2 brake kit, which is a pretty good rival for the Brembos. The discs are a bit smaller, they're 355, not 370, but the discs are actually handed correctly, so the vents work the 
correctly on both sides. With the original discs, they're the same part number and the vents are only rotating in the correct direction on one side, which is not cool. That's the same on the Club Sport S, believe it or not. I love the styling of the mirrors. The whole car was designed by the chap who designed the Lamborghini Murcielago, and you can see there are little bits of Lambo here and there. And that's why the Racing 9 R360 wheels really suit the car, because they are pretty much a total ripoff of the ones on the Huracan. At the back, again, it looks like an FR. Uh, we've got Cupra written across the back of it. We've got a nice badge with 280 on it, which on later models says 290 or 300. We've got a tailgate spoiler, but it's really sort of forgettable. We've got exhaust, but um, they're not particularly visible. They're quite low down and uh, they're oval. They get sissy very quickly. There is a diffuser, but again, it's quite low down. So we don't really get to see an awful lot of it. But overall, I think it's a really nice piece of design. Just a little bit anonymous if you don't have the orange bits on it. Right, let's now have a look at the outside of the Club Sport S. Now it's really easy to describe this car as just a Mark 7 Golf GTI with a redesigned front bumper, a set of the Golf R's Pretorius and a more erect rear spoiler, but that would be doing it a disservice because every single change has been designed to achieve one goal and that's to make it faster around the Nürburgring's Nordschleife. You don't normally think of a front bumper as making a car faster, but because hatchbacks tend to lift themselves up at high speed and become unstable, the team spent many hours and many euros in wind tunnels honing the aerodynamics to push the car down onto the ground and the front bumper works in sync with the tailgate spoiler. Other than that, it's pretty normal Mark 7 here. We've got the bi-zonal headlights, we've got the stripe through the grille, we've even got the radar. This was a bit of a controversial bit of the Club Sport S spec for the UK market only. I don't think they're in any other market, but the UK insurers insisted that every Mark 7 Golf had the front assist radar. This redesign of the front bumper had the effect of actually making it look more modern. I think Mark 7s now are looking a bit dated and this looks at least as modern as a 7.5. Down the side it's relatively plain, we've just got the same dagger badge. There's nothing that says Club Sport S apart from down here where this decal on this black car is actually very subtle. But at least it says Club Sport on it unlike the Mark 8s. The wheels are the 8x19 Pretorias with 235 3519 tyres from the factory. Every Club Sport S would have had Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2s, but because they're a bit marginal on the road in cold and wet conditions, a lot of owners upgraded to Michelin Pilot Sport 4S, or as I have, the Goodyear Eagle F1 Super Sport. The brakes are the same size as a normal GTI, 340 mil. They've got the same caliper, but the disc is a two-piece, which means that they're a bit lighter and they also dissipate heat better which means they last longer on a track. I'm pretty sure the team didn't want to fit the Cooper 370mm discs because it would have added more weight and they didn't actually need that amount of stopping power on the Nürburgring because it's not like you, you weigh anchor from really high speeds to pretty much nothing like you can do on a normal race circuit. One thing you may not notice initially but when you notice it you can't really not see it is that the front wheels and I think the back wheels as well have got quite a bit more camber on them so instead of sitting like that they sit in at the top more. The reason for that is that it means that when you, you corner hard the tyre remains in the optimum position. Why don't they do that to every car? Well that's a good question. I think it probably increases um, tyre wear and fuel consumption to achieve that. They didn't just get the spanners on the bolts, they actually had to re design the hub and that's not on the Club Sport Edition 40 that's purely for the 400 units that they made of the Club Sport S. We've got a red caliper by the way it says Club Sport S on it so that's a unique caliper for the car when it comes to the badging but it's otherwise the same as on a uh, GTI Performance. At the back we've got that spoiler which looks cool but also does the job which makes it even cooler. We've got the Golf R's tinted rear lights We've got a gloss black inlay at the bottom of the bumper. I wouldn't say it was a diffuser because it's completely smooth. In there we've got two big tailpipes. Now they look massive when this car came out in 2016, but actually the 7.5 GTI, both models, normal and performance, have got tailpipes that look pretty much identical. So yeah, it's not night and day different at the back, but overall, particularly in black, I think, that's just my opinion, I think it's a really 
a really good looking car. Right now, let's have a look inside the Seat Leon Cupra 280. That's tricky to talk about a Mark III Leon interior without somebody saying it's really cheap in there compared to a Mark VII Golf. Well, let's set the record straight once and for all. Some of the material quality is a bit down on the Mark VII Golf. I'm pretty sure the build quality is identical. This car's done 58,000 miles squeak and rattle free. Compared to the Mark VIII Golf, it's actually not that much of a downgrade, but let's not go there in this video. I think the key point is though, compared to other brands like Honda, Hyundai and Ford, this is a much nicer cabin and that's really really important golf and a3 have been you know leaders in their cabins really in that segment the other brands are a long way behind so this being a bit behind the golf it's not actually that big a deal and in some ways it's actually better for example the infotainment screen which is the same as the one in the golf 5.8 inch touchscreen is in a better position because your eyes are at the same height as for the instrument cluster so it's much easier to use there without distraction We've got the same dual climate control as well. This car does have one ace up its sleeve. It's got these bucket seats. The sub eight models, you might say weirdly, don't come as these with these as standard, still an option. That's probably because they're not any more supportive than the standard seats, but yeah, they look, they look really good. I like the white bits that brighten up an otherwise quite um, dull cabin. They're on the door cards as well, which without them would look quite cheap. There is ambient lighting, but that only really does its job in the dark, which is not most of the time. This car does have the Seat sound system, so it's got a little badge on the speakers. I do believe that does make it two seconds faster around the Nürburgring if you're listening to the Prodigy. We've got reasonable carpets. We've got nice floor mats, nice quality, golf quality, um, piping and stitching in contrasting sort of silver. We've got a gear knob that's gloss black, piano black with the Cupra logo and a sort of quite cheap gator, but with contrast stitching on there. Again, contrast stitching on the handbrake pull. And it is a handbrake. These must be lighter because the calipers don't have motors on them. We've got standard cruise control. We've got automatic headlights. We've got electric folding mirrors. But weirdly, they don't just fold when you lock the car up. You have to press the remote again to lock the car for them to come in, which I don't mind. It's, uh, it's good that there's something different about this compared to the Golf. We have got stainless pedals. We've got lovely stainless sill protectors, which are all always missing from a bloody Golf. And this car has been upgraded to Apple CarPlay Android Auto. The Club Sport S doesn't have that standard, but can be upgraded. We've got a soft touch dash, which some Volkswagens don't come with. Black headlining and black apelers for the sporty look. A little cheap is that we don't have a Flockline glove box or door card. That's gone from Golf 8, but it's obviously on 7. Front center armrest, not available on Club Sport S to save weight. But the little thing about the Seat Lounge cabin that does mark it out as a little bit cheaper is the way the center console is attached to the body. On the Golf, there's a screw with a nice little cap covering it up so you can't actually see it on the Leon. It's exposed and that really is to me the biggest difference between this and a Golf. Well it's quite an interesting exercise hopping straight out of the Leon Cooper into this Golf GTI because it feels even more expensive in here than I remember it. That's partly to do with the acres of piano black. It's not just around the instrument cluster. It comes all the way down the center console. We've got acres of Alcantara as well and we've got higher quality plastics. We've also got the incredible Recaro bucket seats. These are most definitely more supportive than the standard Golf GTI seats but you do lose the side airbag and you do lose the underseat storage. In fact there are quite a few things missing from this car spec in the name of lightness, namely front and rear parking sensors which are bound to catch me out one day. We haven't got folding mirrors we haven't got Apple CarPlay, so that can be enabled. We haven't got a front centre armrest, so quite humorously we've got the two cup holders for the rear seat passenger still. What we do have though is a unique number engraved into the surround of the gear gator, which is quite a nice touch. It looks a little bit more integrated than the stick-on badge you got with Edition 30 and Edition 40. We've got Alcantara on the steering wheel with a dead ahead marker, which is um, 
unique to the Club Sport Edition 40 and the Club Sport S. We have got stainless pedals are there, nothing special. The mats, which I don't actually have in the car right now, are a nice quality fabric with a red piping on the outside and a Golf GTI logo, very similar to the Cupra mats. And look at that gear knob. So Golf Ball is back, a bit of alloy around the base of it and then a silver and red around the gear gate on the top of it. We've got dual climate just like in the Leon, though the knobs look a little bit more expensive and they're highlighted in silver. We've got heated seats just like in the Leon. We've got a 5.8 inch infotainment screen just like in the Leon and we've got analog clocks as well. So these cars are both pre the digital instrument cluster age and to be perfectly honest, they're no worse for it. We do have auto headlights as well but we don't have cruise control, which can get a bit annoying. What we do have, and this is a personal favorite of mine, is a red tipped seat belt, which they don't really put on many cars these days, but it does liven up the cabin no end. Obviously the big omission is that we don't have rear seats in the name of saving weight. And that's okay with me. I just think of it as a really practical sports car. It's got a massive boot. We don't have a spare wheel either. Actually the Leon does. And let's go and have a look in the boot of these two cars and see where the real differences lie. Now the beauty of a good hot hatch is they blend practicality and performance in a nice compact package. One minute you can be having a blast on a B-road, next minute you can fold the seats down and turn it into a small van or you can fold them back up and carry four passengers and the Leon stays true to that formula to perfection. It's got a really really good boots it's got a split fold rear seat it's even got a ski hatch in the middle of it okay it doesn't have adjustable boot height on the floor but do you really need it underneath the boot carpet we have actually got a spare wheel which is quite rare on the cooper i'm pretty sure that's a factory option with all the tools as well in the golf things are somewhat different the golf was always the car that had the spare wheel when the leon and the skodas you had to pay extra for it actually on the Golf 8 it's gone as well. Here we have the spare wheel well but we don't have a, a spare wheel so it's completely bare in here. In fact Volkswagen went a bit too far stripping this car out because they forgot to supply a towing eye which every car should have. Volkswagen UK had to pass it on to dealers and they passed them on to owners some of whom had already taken delivery. So yeah it's a big big compromise in the name of lightness but if you want the ultimate high that's the price you have to pay. Now, let's have a look under the bonnet and see how they differ there. Now here, things are actually quite similar. Both cars have got four-cylinder petrol turbo EA888 Gen 3 engines with engine codes, both beginning with CJX. That means they've got the same hardware, but the software that runs the hardware is defined by the final letter of the engine code. And this is CJXA, that's CJXG. That's why this produces 280 metric horsepower and 350 newton meter of the torque, while the Club Sport S is 310 metric horsepower and 380 newton meters of torque. Apart from the engines, we've both got the same six speed manual gearboxes. I'm not sure if the ratios are different. And we've got the VAQ front differential, which is basically a Haldex coupling for the front axle. When it senses one wheel spinning, it will lock that drive shaft and reduce wheel spin. It has an uncanny effect of reducing understeer on the exits of corners. It doesn't really help them in straight line acceleration. You'll still get whipped by a Golf R because 0 to 60 time on these cars is actually 5.7 and 5.8. Yeah, weirdly, this is faster. Maybe the Cup 2s really aren't that good at standing start acceleration if they haven't been warmed up. I found that on a car where drag race when I got my ass whipped by a Golf a GTI Performance. The less said about that, the better. Anyway, that's what makes up these cars. Let's go and see how they actually perform on the road. Well guys, I thought we'd start off then with my set Leon Cooper 280. I've had this for 10 months now, done about 4,000 miles, two very hard track events, the latter of which gave me my best ever track driving session. I was on track with the guys from Sprogley Motorsport in their Mark 8 Golf GTI Club Sport and Simon Harper at Talk Cars in his Club Sport S and this car did a very, very good job. Drag race! <laughs> we're both manual, we're both three door. Oh, he gets into his stride, doesn't he? But 
into fifth. Check out the video if you haven't yet. I'll put a link in the description of the video below. But it was a daily car primarily. It replaced the Mark 8 Golf GTI Club Sport and it was a brilliant road car as well. I would say it's probably one of the best cars I've ever owned that's done track and road work so well. And that's largely down to the fact this car's got dynamic chassis control as standard. It makes it compliant on a British B road like this or over speed humps in town. But when you put it in Cooper mode on a track, it doesn't feel too soft. And that's very unusual for a car that's comfortable on the road. That is the magic of DCC, guys. It's also been quite economical. It's done over 35 to the gallon. And yeah, it's just a great all-rounder. It doesn't really make any more demands of you than any normal Leon. And it's big fun as well. So this is a road I drive a lot. And when other people are braking, you're just turning. And if they decide to brake some more, well, you've got even better brakes. So we've got Racing Line Stage 2, which is um, just a really nice brake kit. It held up to a very hot, hard track day at Bedford Autodrome and it's, it feels good on the road as well. It's got nice pedal feel. Racing line make a lot of effort to engineer in feel rather than sort of ultimate power necessarily by being very careful how big the pistons are that they put into the calipers. And this just feels lovely. If you brake harder, it brakes more. It's not just like a, a normal modern braking system where you get all that braking effort right at the top of the pedal. You can really modulate it and that's really quite special. Where this car sort of fails for me is in two areas. Firstly, the throttle response is a bit flat. It feels fast. I thought it was um, mapped originally, probably because of how well it performed on track, but it's not. But it doesn't really feel as sharp as a Club Sport S. The other thing is steering feel as well. It's a little bit glassy and non-communicative. The Mark 8 Club Sport, which I drove back to back with this car, actually felt more um, communicative. But the biggest weakness over the Club Sport S is the damping of this corner confirms you can feel it go over that initial hollow and then it comes down and then goes back up again and then settles i would say its damping is of a lesser quality than that of the club sport s and that's pretty important to how this car performs on the road because damping is really crucial for keeping the tire in contact with the road don't get me wrong it's not bad but i think the club sport s has had a lot of development in that area from some really clever guys and i think it feels magical while this just feels good i could be wrong though but there's only one way to find out so let's go and drive my mark 7 golf gti club sport s well guys welcome to my mark 7 golf for gti club sport s i've had it now for a week i've done 500 very enjoyable miles in it it's a surprisingly easy car to stick miles on because even though it's missing bits and pieces it's still inherently a golf we've got heated seats Bluetooth, navigation, dual climate control, even though you can delete it on the Club Sport S, the first owner of this car, like I did with mine, sensibly decided to keep it and it does it does make a car very usable. Okay, it's not as authentic as a ring record car which didn't have aircon, but I don't think that really matters because I won't be driving it on the ring very much, but on a road like this on a day like today, which is actually still February but quite warm, it does make all the difference between feeling comfortable and not. Also key to being comfortable is the standard DCC adaptive damping. This works on a British B road. It works around town on you know speed humps and stuff, but it's very, very important to this car because it works on the Nürburgring. If you watch the lap record, you'll see the test driver, Benny Loyster, who set the record, sort of use the curbs more than he did the tarmac and to do that you need really compliant dampers and that's what he got with this car so you need softness but you need them to be damped as well and it feels a lot more sophisticated in that respect than the Cupra it also feels more sophisticated in the steering there's a lot more feel you can actually feel the texture of the road as well and partly it's probably because we've got Alcantara but there's de definitely a lot more feel to this car than there is in the Cupra which helps you uh, just key into the road more when you're on it and just in increases the levels of enjoyment. Before I forget this car makes a lot more exhaust noise than the Cupra that's really depending on the fake noise which I switched off on mine.
This car has also got the fake noise, but it's got a lot of pop popping and banging as well, and exhaust noise. together because the fake noise happens when you're on the gas as I will demonstrate now and then the popping and banging happens when you come off so actually it's not as annoying as it would be in other cars where it's all fake like the Cupra I mean this car does do a DSG fart and it's manual which is quite hilarious I think the engineers had a conversation and they got confused about what was meant by fart because fart is a German word for drive but it also means fart you know do a fart uh, in English so I think they said we must improve the fart you must improve the fart like the board of directors came down and said you must improve the fart with the club support s and the engineers went did he mean the fart or the fart and so they made it drive really well they made it fart really well as well I think the way this deals with a British B road is is quite different to the Cupra. So it's got better damping, better steering feel, and it's got a lot more throttle response as well. I was going to say more power. That Cupra dyno at 300, even though it's 280. This is just 10 horsepower more. Not really that noticeable. So I don't know whether it's the mapping or whether it's that bit lighter, but it just feels savage. You can. That's, that's the throttle response from a, a turbo car. It's, it's mental and that really is actually one of the most addictive things about this car. Yes, the way it goes around corners is good, but the way it explodes out of them is naughty. That was the VAQ diff as well, helping me get on the gas on a not particularly grippy day. It's only seven degrees when these tyres really won't be that far into their operating window. So yeah, it did the ring lap record, but it also knows how to have fun and that's, that's what makes it such a special car. Will we ever see anything better than this from Volkswagen? I very, very much doubt it. Don't get me wrong, the Mark 8 Club Sport does have a lot of the elements of this car within it. I've been trying to get that over to people, you know, while I had my car for 18 months. It's a great drive, but it's not. It's a great drive for a normal GTI. It's just not as focused as this. And if you want the best golf driving experience, if you want probably one of the best hot hatch driving experiences you have to make some sacrifices and I do think in the case of this Club Sport S they are well worth it because it offers the ultimate golf high and there aren't many other hot hatches that can get close to it as well. So guys how do we sum up these two incredible hot hatches? Well if every decision we made about cars had to be rational we'd all be driving around in Dacia Sanderos and being quite happy about it but emotion has been a key part of the car choosing process pretty much ever since marketing departments started pushing them during the post second world war boom and that means the car you buy is often chosen more by your heart than your head the leon cooper 280 is a very sensible car that your head will most definitely approve of it works well on track it's exciting and engaging on the road and it's no harder to live with than any other leon the golf gti club sport s however is when looked at rationally far less convincing in fact i'd question its validity as a gti or even a hot hatch due to the sacrifices an owner needs to make because i've always felt balancing performance and practicality is a key part of a good hot hatch's appeal and something like a mark 7 golf gti performance is far better at doing that and due to the law of diminishing returns, these big sacrifices an owner has to make only result in relatively small dynamic gains, but gains that they most certainly are, and combined,
they move the Club Sport S into a new level of performance we've never seen from a car wearing a GTI or even a VW badges and your heart simply cannot ignore this. In fact, due to how much usability still remains with this car, I'd say it's a better hot hatch than the one hot hatch Evo puts above the Club Sport S back in 2016. That's a Renault Megane 275 Trophy R, which I think means that the Golf GTI Club Sport S is the best hot hatch ever. I'm not biased, honestly. And the best bit is due to just 150 coming to the UK, some of which have already been exported, depreciation is pretty much non-existent. That means you can have the best for less. So yes, while the Cooper really is a highly capable yet very underrated car, the Club Sport S actually justifies all its hype. It's a car you buy with your heart, but your head still approves of. As ever guys, thanks for watching this Volks Wizard video. As I mentioned in the previous video, I am now buying Club Sport Edition 40 and Club Sport S GTIs for a very reputable dealer. So if you've got a good unmodified example you're looking to sell, then get in touch at andrew at volkswizard.co.uk. The details are also in the description of this video. Keep commenting, keep subscribing, and I'll see you for the next one very soon.